Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our Lindley Fall Processor Conference for 2019. Uh, my name is Lindley Gwenap. I'm the principal analyst of the Lindley Group and also the editor-in-chief at Microprocessor Report. Uh, if you're not familiar with Microprocessor Report, I hope you'll have a chance to check it out at the table outside. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time uh, writing about AI and uh, AI accelerator chips uh, over the last uh, few years and uh, been uh, also writing a report called A Guide to Processors for Deep Learning. So I spent a lot of time uh, looking at, uh, at this area and I wanted to uh, cover that today. Uh, so the agenda for my talk, I want to start off with uh, some uh, basics, uh, try to level set. I know some people here are very familiar uh, with deep learning, other people may not be, so I want to uh, spend a little time there and then uh, dive into some technology trends that we're seeing uh, in the deep learning accelerator space, and then focus on three of the key markets for AI acceleration, uh, the, the cloud, uh, the edge, and then the automotive market. So uh, that's uh, where we're going. Deep neural networks are kind of the core of where AI research is today. This is what's really energized the AI space over the last several years and enabled us to uh, make some of the uh, achievements uh, that we've been seeing during that time. Uh, the neural network itself is uh, made up of neurons that are connected and the, uh, the data flows through those connections. It's governed by a weight value that's associated with each of those connections. And then the, the, the neuron or the node itself uh, is often uh, using a multiply accumulate operation to compute the next value that it will pass on to the next layer in the network. So the key thing to remember here is that there are a lot of these uh, MAC operations that happen in order to uh, compute the result of a neural network. Um, you know, billions of MAC operations uh, in most of the, the networks that are in common use today. So uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to compute the, the end result. Um, there are two ways to uh, use a neural network. Um, first, the network has to be trained. And so, um, you know, the canonical example of teaching the network to recognize cat photos. You feed it a lot of photos. Some of them have cats, some of them don't. And the, the neural network uh, gradually learns how to identify the cats. Um, and then once the network has been trained, then you use a process called inference to actually use this network in the field. So um, you would want to take uh, random photos off the internet, run it through your neural network, and now you know which photos have cats. So uh, that would be the inference process. So there are two different ways to use the network, and uh, it turns out that we need different kinds of hardware uh, to optimize for those two approaches. Now, what people started doing with neural networks uh, originally was running them on CPUs, and uh, of course, CPUs can run anything. Um, and in particular, uh, you need to do all of these MAC operations I mentioned. Uh, fortunately, uh, most of the modern CPUs have a SIMD architecture, which allows them to execute these MAC operations in parallel. So you might have a compute unit, uh, for example, in an Intel processor that can do 512 bits at once. And so if you are using 32-bit uh, MAC operations, that would be 16 at a time. If you're using 8-bit operations, you can do 64 at a time. Um, so you can get a good amount of parallelism that way. But uh, it's still, at a gigahertz, for example, um, you're getting far less than one teraflop. And you really need teraflops in order to make these big neural networks uh, run at a reasonable speed. So the bottleneck here is really in moving the data around, not in the computation. In a CPU, um, as the diagram shows, you, you take a value out of the register file, you compute on it, and then you move it back into the register file, and then you take it back out again and you keep doing that. So you're constantly moving data in and out of the register file. Uh, this takes time, it takes power, and it creates a uh, overhead of computation. Um, so uh, we're trying to find more efficient architectures uh, than, than the SIMD approach. And systolic arrays are uh, one way to get around that bottleneck. Uh, this was first used for neural networks by Google. 
uh, in their original TPU a few years ago. We're now seeing this type of architecture in various forms in many deep learning accelerators. Um, what you can see here is uh, each of the purple squares is a MAC unit, so it computes the MAC result, and then the data immediately flows to the next MAC unit for a new computation. And this type of structure works really well for uh, the matrix multiplication that is at the heart of most of the convolutional neural networks. So uh, basically, you've taken the matrix multiply, you've hard-coded it, into the hardware, and now it moves very efficiently without the bottleneck of putting the data uh, in and out of the register file. Um, this can provide you know, 5x, 10x kind of improvement in terms of power efficiency for these MAC operations in a matrix multiply. And uh, the other nice thing about this is that you can scale it up. So you can have a smaller array, uh, you can have a bigger array. Uh, uh, Google has implemented arrays as large as 65,000 MAC units um, in, in, a, in a single array. So uh, you can get tremendous uh, scale of performance using this simple, regular architecture. But there's other issues as you're processing a neural network. Um, what people have discovered is that many of these neural networks have a lot of values that end up being zero or very small. And when you feed them into a MAC unit, you're basically computing nothing. So why not just skip the whole thing? And so some of the hardware today uh, deals with sparsity by detecting these zero values and just disabling the MAC unit. That saves power. Um, you can also rearrange the computations to remove those zero values. So now you keep the MAC units busy doing meaningful calculations. Um, and uh, so there's different approaches to addressing the sparsity uh, that can be uh, more efficient uh, than others. But you know, this is a good approach to improve um, upon the systolic array and try to uh, further increase the efficiency of an accelerator. Uh, you'll hear a lot about different kinds of data types uh, as, as, over the course of the next two days. Um, so in training, uh, what we often use is floating point uh, math, uh, typically 32-bit floating point, which gives you a lot of uh, precision and a lot of range in the exponent uh, to handle very small, very large weights and, and any rapid changes in the weights that happen during training. Um, people have uh, been working with 16-bit floating point instead, as well as a new uh, format called bfloat16. Um, you know, these uh, uh, seem to provide uh, most of the benefits of 32-bit floating point, but because they're smaller, you can fit twice as many calculations in the same amount of hardware. So now you can double, basically, the computation rate and the power efficiency. On the inference side, um, integer formats have become more popular. Uh, once you've trained the network, you know what the weights are. They're not going to change. And you can uh, scale them into an integer format uh, in a way that's more efficient. Uh, integer computation takes less power than floating point computation. And you can get the, the data size down to 8 bits and even less in some cases. And again, 8-bit uh, computation now doubles uh, the throughput versus 16-bit computation. And uh, tests have shown that moving from FP32 to 8-bit integer uh, really uh, can give you four times or more uh, improvement in power efficiency. So, so big win for going to inference, uh, for, to going to integer on the inference side. There's other functions that happen in a neural network besides the MAC, and it helps to uh, put some hardware in to accelerate those as well. Uh, after computing the value of a particular layer, um, you often want to uh, reduce the range of those output values using a normalization function. Um, some of the ones here, sigmoid, tangent, are, are, um, are hyperbolic, so, um, so it can be difficult to compute these in you know, a traditional processor with add and multiply instructions. Uh, so uh, in these AI-optimized processors, they often hard code you know, these types of functions to make you know, this part of the computation move more quickly. 
And similarly, there's other uh, parts of the neural network that you can move into hardware as well and uh, further uh, reduce the amount of computation that's required. So as you're building an AI-optimized accelerator, it makes sense to find all of the common functions and accelerate those in hardware. Now the other uh, issue that you have to deal with, though, is on the memory side. Uh, you've built a very powerful compute engine. You have to be able to feed uh, the data into that. Uh, the weights, uh, particularly uh, for uh, inference calculation, uh, always remain the same. So it makes sense to put those in memory as close as possible to your compute unit. Um, the activations um, are the, the data, the results that you're computing, that change every time. And so you really don't want to cache those. You don't want to hold them anywhere. You just want to stream them uh, through your compute unit and uh, consume them and, and change and, and then store them back into memory again. So you can either use on-chip memory, off-chip memory for the activations, but in either case, you need very high bandwidth. So uh, you need to make sure that your memory bandwidth is scaling uh, with the compute power. And in the case of some of these very powerful uh, accelerators, uh, you may need uh, something like a high bandwidth memory, HBM, uh, in order to satisfy all of the uh, data requirements of that compute engine. So, uh, so it's tricky to design the memory system. One way to break that memory bottleneck is to do the computation closer to the memory. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've seen a few different approaches to this. Um, one of them is to actually do analog computation. Um, and uh, you know, shown here, you can get a different uh, uh, current that comes through the memory depending on the value that you've stored in the resistance. And then um, you can conduct the multiplication using Ohm's law. And then the current flows through. And you can add the currents together using Kirchhoff's law. And now you've computed a MAC operation without any digital functions at all. So this kind of analog-based approach can reduce uh, the power by another order of magnitude. Um, and uh, so it's a very promising approach. Uh, we've seen several companies uh, pursuing this approach. Uh, Mythic is going to be talking about this uh, t uh, tomorrow. And um, you know, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see if this can actually get into uh, a production kind of scenario. Another approach that's being investigated is spiking neural networks. Uh, this is a, a, a different approach from what I've been talking about, the deep neural networks. Um, it, it, it's sometimes called a neuromorphic uh, type of computation because it's trying to emulate more closely what's in the, the brain, how the brain would, would uh, process data. Um, in, in this case, instead of sending a digital value, a, a, an integer or floating point value, you just send a simple uh, spike. Um, and um, then when that reaches the neuron, you're just counting spikes. And at, at a certain point, uh, you output another spike. So the neurons themselves are much easier to implement. So this, of course, then means that the power consumption can be much lower. And uh, the, the network can compute uh, very easily. Um, the downside of these spiking neural networks is that so far, um, they don't seem to scale well up into large problems. But for some of these uh, simple tasks, um, you can uh, get very good results. And we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Intel later today about their um, uh, neural network, their neuromorphic chip. Uh, Brain Chip uh, is another company that we'll be hearing from them uh, tomorrow uh, that's using this approach. 